Welcome. Welcome to this candidate forum for Sunnyvale City Council. I'm Roberta Holloman, a member of the League of Women Voters, and I'll be moderating tonight's forum. The League of Women Voters hosts forums like this to allow voters to see the candidates and hear them address questions of interest to the public. Our goal is to enable voters to learn about the candidates so they will make informed so choices. The League of Women Voters never endorses or opposes a candidate or a political party. Three seats of the Sun uh, Sunnyvale City Council are up for election this November. There are two candidates for each seat and all six candidates are here tonight. They will be seated on the dais and question one seat at a time. As you see, we have seat one up right now. Um, and that will make it easier for you to see who's running against whom. Voters for, may vote for one candidate for each seat. The candidate that gets the most votes for his seat in November will be elected to the council. The candidates have agreed to a format and ground rules for tonight's forum. The candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to the questions. A timer seated in the front of the room will give candidates visual signals to help them pace their responses. We have allowed time uh, for rebuttals. Each candidate is allowed two 30-second rebuttals. Uh, the candidates have been given two rebuttal cards to indicate to me that they wish to make a rebuttal to something the other candidate has said. And, um, um, this, and I need to tell the candidates that this is for rebuttal only and not a new statement or a continu continuation of a former statement. The questions for tonight's forum were developed by a team of League members based upon their own research and questions submitted by the public via email. We thank the public so much for the qu wonderful questions you have sent in. Since we received ample questions from the public in advance, we are not collecting more questions from the audience tonight. The forum is being recorded and can be seen by going to the League's website, lwvcs.org. The ground rules ask candidates not to use forum recordings for campaign purposes. We also encourage the audience not to record the forum because we want it to be shown in its entirety. Finally, we ask the audience to refrain from displays of support or opposition. Please hold your applause until the end of the forum. We'll now turn our attention to the candidates. Thank you for running for this office. So often you hear us uh, ask the candidates for an opening statement or a closing statement, but this uh, time we're incorporating those ideas into the questions we ask them. So here is the, f the opening uh, first question, and I will start with Mr. Alexander. What do you bring to the city council that Sunnyvale needs but doesn't have? Thank you for everyone being here tonight. I think that it speaks volumes that so many people actually came out. Um, that is giving me hope that you guys want something different. Um, my name is Henry Alexander, and I'm running on behalf of the citizens and the families of Sunnyvale. Um, as a Bay Area native, 13-year uh, resident of Sunnyvale, uh, my wife of 21 years and I raised our families and uh, educated them in the public school systems. Now, I've had a six-year commission background, and I've also been committed to the community. And what I think I bring to this election that's different is a community sense, someone who is just like you, who has raised their family here in Sunnyvale, and someone who is committed to focus on the residents first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Larson. Yes, and, and thank you as well for everyone coming out tonight, either coming here or tuning in, because it's so important uh, to pay attention to elections and be informed as voters. So some of the things that I bring to City Council, and I would have to say that City Council already has these since I'm already on the Council. Um, one is over eight years of experience with Sunnyvale government, first on the Planning Commission and now on City Council. Um, but also my grassroots background. Before I was appointed to Planning Commission, there was an issue in my neighborhood. I got involved with my neighbors. We successfully persuaded City Council to change a project that was coming in our neighborhood. Um, so I've personally experienced what that's like to approach City Council for the first time with an issue. Um, I also um, have a strong record on housing um, during my last five years. 
Um, and I'm very much looking forward to building on the momentum, the success that we've had over the last five years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with you, Mr. Larson. What is the most important priority for Sunnyvale City Council to work on in the coming year, and why? I would say absolutely the most important priority is housing. There are so many other issues that get tied into housing. Um, traffic, for example, is fundamentally a housing issue. If people can't live near their jobs, then they have to commute long distances. That creates congestion. Um, those are very expensive highway miles to maintain, and that's less time they have with their families. Um, also, um, the, w as climate change becomes more important, um, having or resolving climate change becomes more important. Being able to rebuild our housing stock to be more energy efficient, to be more water efficient is absolutely crucial. Um, so, and then if you just look at the overcrowding that's happening and the uh, lack of affordability of housing, obviously that's a supply issue, not enough housing. So housing is the number one issue. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. Thank you. I think that the uh, growth of this city is what's most important in the fact that there has been an abundance of developer growth and business growth within the city, which has exasperated some of the problems that we see in Sunnyvale. Now, I believe that it's really hard to make high-density housing work in a culture that we live in in Sunnyvale in the Bay Area. So you have to question, what is your job stability? Um, are you going to move every time that you get a new job um, with a family? Where does your spouse work? Where are your kids going to school? So it's really important that we look at the, the entire infrastructure. I'm not a no-growth candidate. So I am in fully in favor of people wanting to live and raise their families in Sunnyvale. But it has to be done right. It has to be done correctly. And it also has to be done with some sort of purpose. So it's not going to affect the safety of the residents, nor is it going to affect the overcrowding of the schools. Thank you. Thank you. And with next question, Mr. Alexander, we'll start with you. In Sunnyvale, the median rent is $3,000, and the median home price is $1.9 million. What strategies would you champion to help make Sunnyvale a more affordable place to live? I think we have to look at um, how we've gotten into this dilemma. Now, um, rents are going to go up no matter what. We live in probably the best weather that you can imagine. Um, we live in a place called Sunnyvale for a reason, right? And so that being said, I think that it's a bigger issue as far as than bigger issue than supply and demand. Um, to to suggest that by building where there's uh, high density instances where people are going to be stacked on top of each other, that's just not the right thing to do. So I think that um, looking at it from a larger perspective, um, we have to look at the affordability of maybe some below market rate housing, the supply of those things. Um, I think that for housing, it's going to continue to go up because this is what we live in and it's not going down anytime soon, but we have to fix the infrastructure to make sure that it works. Thank you. Mr. Larson? Yeah, so um, we have created a very attractive community here and that attracts people and that's um, creating some of the, the supply and demand imbalance. Also, the Silicon Valley economy is booming. Even if Sunnyvale were to stop building housing, we have jobs being created all over the region. This is a center of excellence for technology in the world. Um, so people are coming here, whether or not we're building housing. If we don't build the housing, we get overcrowding and we get very expensive housing. Um, some of the things we're looking at are zoning to cluster more housing near the Caltrain stations and along El Camino. We want to protect our existing single family neighborhoods because those are wonderful. But we also want to put new housing near transit so people can use public transit. Um, the village center concept where we create, put apartments above um, sh neighborhood shopping centers so you can live and, and shop in the same area or downsize within your neighborhood and also affordable housing is very important as well. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll start with you this time. Um, State Proposition 10 provides for cities to establish local rent control policies. Do you support or oppose Prop 10 and why or why not? So I oppose Prop 10. I think that even if Prop 10 were to pass, 
Um, I think the state legislature would come back with some additional um, changes for uh, kind of the, the bounds on rent control. And I think it's very unknown what that would be. So um, I, I prefer to stick with the known that we have. Um, and I'm also very concerned about uh, discouraging the development of new housing. If, um, if we were to, um, in some scenarios with Prop 10 passing, I think it's very likely that we would see many fewer um, housing projects move forward. And I think that would just make this an even more exclusive area. And I think it would be hard to maintain the diversity of income levels and backgrounds that we have in this community that really make us a complete community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alexander? Yeah, I, I would support this repeal, repeal um, only if there was an improved version of the state law. Um, so I, I think we align in that. Um, but the law, I think, should be amended to prevent the establishment of rent, contr rent control units for a year that's more current than 1995, in my opinion. Um, so the, the study issue that has come about based on um, the Mountain View Ordinance model, um, I think it's a good start. Um, but I think we need to also explore um, what's the manageable amount. Where are the elderly and disabled having a reasonable opportunity to continue living in the city where they established their lives in? Um, when that's taken away, um, you have the potential for gentrification, and, and that's not what anyone wants to see. So when I'm elected, I will make a, a priority to seek any com additional community input and provide solutions um, that will help manage this very real issue. Thank you. And we'll start with you again, Mr. Alexander. What, what budget, budget challenges do you see the council needing to address in the next three years? I think for um, the budget, I think what we need to start looking at is um, some of the um, wages within the city. I think that's a budget issue that is a uh, hot item. And it's not to say that anyone should be having their, but their pensions taken away. Um, but I believe that we should start looking at the privatization of this and from the standpoint that um, people who are coming new into the city as employees, um, perhaps that is something that they would do rather than the people who have pensions that were promised these pensions um, should still receive them. I'm all for that. But I also believe that um, by doing so, looking at these types of things, that we can look at uh, other issues that could affect the city for the long term more than five years from now. Um, but I think it's something we definitely need to look at. Mr. Larson? Thank you. Yeah, so the city has been paying very close attention to budgets, uh, budgets, uh, pensions, um, and budgets. Uh, we've hired our own actuary to give us better projections than CalPERS, more realistic projections. Um, we have put in place um, a number of changes, such as multiple tiers of pensions, so that the newer employees coming in already have a, a different pension um, than the existing employees. They will take probably, we're projecting 15 years for that to, um, to really get us over the hump. Our pension costs will be going up for about 15 years, and then they'll come down on the other side. That would be a great time to be on city council, but for now, we have to kind of tighten our belts and stay the course. Um, it's challenging because, because costs go up faster than revenues. Um, for example, our sales tax revenues are flat to slightly down, even though property tax is going up. Um, and so we really have to be very fiscally prudent. I really want to keep with our 20-year uh, financial budgeting model uh, to keep us on track. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Larson, proposals have been made to change Sunnyvale's um, election system to district elections in which residents in geographical areas would choose their representatives. Do you support or oppose this proposal? So the, the driving factor behind this proposal is the California Voting Rights Act, and the goal is to uh, get councils that more represent the demographics of our community. And I'll admit, that's a problem right now. Um, we ha our current council is all white and only one woman out of seven. Um, however, because Sunnyvale is so blended demographically, I don't, th I don't see how you would draw districts that would enhance 
the demographic representation of city council. We already have good representation from all parts of the city. When I was first elected to council, we had three council members from northern Sunnyvale, three from central, one from south. Now we have one from the north, three from central, three from the south. So it does change over time, but on average, it's very, very uh, representative, very blended. I think with districts, you get geographic diversity, but you don't get demographic diversity. And so I think we really need to look at the other impediments that are stopping pe good people, good candidates from running for council. Thank you. Mr. Alexander? I, I think it's not the question of what we support. It's what we've been seeing the pattern as being. Um, in other cities, what we are seeing is that people are bringing these cases to cities and saying that there should be a district uh, election format. And these people are winning. And this is the path that Sunnyvale is on its way to do. Um, we've also seen that there has been a uh, actual complaint that has been registered to the city that says that there is a disproportionate amount of Asians who are represented on the council. And so these are things that we can stop immediately before we have to go through any expensive court costs to take something to court that inevitably might just end up being the future based on even cities as close as Santa Clara and any of the other cities around the, the state. So I think that um, from the standpoint of what it is that we can and, and want to do, it is what it is. We are in this climate now and it's going to go to district elections. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. Sunnyvale currently has a housing mitigation fee that charges commercial development an impact fee that goes into an affordable housing program. MTC, the Metropolitan Transit Commission, is exploring a regionally assessed commercial development fee for affordable housing. Do you agree or disagree with this kind of regional fee? I think that looking at it from a standpoint of what we need to focus on. Bay Area is a interconnected web of cities. So um, we have to work with neighboring cities to do something. Um, now, relying on development and developers to finance that might be a, 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 a cause for uh, celebration in certain points, but when those developments start to decrease, then where are we getting funding from? So this is something that we need to look at from a larger perspective than to just rely on um, the funding of taxes from develop development. Um, we need to perhaps look at the bigger picture and look at other explorations of, of budgets so that we can look at our spend at a very closer and, and, and more prudent way. Thank you. Mr. Larson? Yeah, I would prefer to keep the funds uh, established at the local level um, because every city is different. Sunnyvale is very different than San Jose. We're different uh, needs and, and different economic environment. Um, so I think each city should set what is appropriate for the city. Sunnyvale has been a real leader on housing. I hear that when I go around the Bay Area. Other cities say, hey, wow, Sunnyvale, you're doing a really good job. How are you doing that? How did you get this program in place or that program? So I'm really proud that we're actually on the cutting edge. And I think if we had a regional fee, that would actually be a step back, potentially, from where we're at. Um, I would also get concerned about the politics involved, um, the, the, the bigger players. I'm not going to say any names, but, um, but I think you know which cities I'm talking about would be able to pull more of the money into them. Um, and I'd rather use the money locally so that we benefit um, Sunnyvale workers, Sunnyvale residents. Thank you. So we'll start with you with this question. Would you share what significant contributions, if any, to your 2018 city council campaign were from PACs? If so, what PACs? Um, so I don't, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, so I'm just kind of going off the top of my head. Um, so I've, I've gotten campaign contributions from a number of different sources. Um, some of the PACs are local PACs, uh, Sun PAC, which represents local businesses, um, several different labor organizations, um, uh, Silicon Valley uh, Association of Realtors uh, recently gave me a contribution. Um, however, I would also say that I am my own largest contributor to my campaign, um, contributing more than all of those PACs combined. Um, so I've got skin in the game. 
Um, I'm, I'm very committed to this. I've also gotten a lot of contributions from individuals. Um, probably 83% of my contributions I calculated earlier today were actually from individuals, from over 80 different individuals. So a lot of um, donations that are 3% or less of what I'm collecting. Thank you. Mr. Alexander? None. <laughs> um, and I will continue on that a little bit. I, I think that it's very uh, t a very touchy subject for a lot of people. Um, again, I've said this before, um, please don't think that when people are donating from a PAC that this is money that's going into the, the person's pocket. Um, this is about how, um, how you're getting favor from these people who are providing you the funds to actually win and run a campaign. So mine have been all from residents, so I'm beholden to you. Um, I can't say that um, for me that it makes more sense to do it that way than, than any other way. However, um, I think that from the standpoint of how you're voting for certain uh, projects that come up, especially when they're um, financed by the same people who have um, financed your election, that's when you're, above you're not above reproach, and I think that should be called the question. Thank you. Um, I think you know which one I'm going to call on next. <laughs> so, Mr. Alexander, uh, we turn to traffic for a minute. Besides the 101-237 Matilda Interchange Project currently underway, what other road improvements or transportation projects do you envision to bring traffic relief to North Sunnyvale in light of anticipated additional development? Yeah, that's gonna be a fun one. And I think that uh, when I'm on council, that's gonna be one of the, the major priorities. I think that um, we start to, we're gonna to have to start looking at um, what it takes for the city to look at something a um, little bit out of the box, like perhaps um, free shuttles where people want, are taken where they want and need to go. Um, and make them electric or hybrid so that they reduce greenhouse gas. Um, and we can pilot these routes to see what works and doesn't work, um, but we do have to do, take some sort of, sort of proactive measure in order to ensure that we have better traffic flow. But what I disagree with is creating more density of development and, and uh, high density residents, uh, especially in those areas, and expect for people to live, work, and shop in one compact area. That's just not how we function in this city. Um, so I think that we need to explore and be proactive and think out of the box rather than what we've been doing for several years. Thank you. So on Lawrence Expressway, we've already uh, started working with the city of Santa Clara and the county as well um, to do grade separation where we would lower Lawrence Expressway so it goes underneath the roads that are crossing so you don't have signal lights there. That would make a huge difference for um, traffic on Lawrence Expressway. Also, we're talking with VTA about setting up a shuttle in the Peary Park and downtown areas, connecting those areas, an on-demand shuttle. That's already in progress we're talking about. Um, and we have a huge opportunity as we take another look at the Moffat Park area north of 237 for community benefits. Um, Google has purchased a lot of property there. They have been very proactive about finding other ways to get their employees around, and I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity to get community benefits from them and others in, their, um, in that area as they want to uh, modernize their offices to also get a be uh, benefit for North Sunnyvale. And finally, we're updating our bicycle master plan. We can fill in the gaps in our bicycle network. Thanks. Thank you. Sunnyvale has led the effort to create Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which now provides 100% greenhouse gas-free electricity to our community and other cities nearby. What additional changes are needed to significantly reduce our community's carbon pollution and make the city more resilient to climate change? 
Yeah, so I think s starting Silicon Valley Clean Energy, that was a huge home run. I was very excited to be part of launching that. I'm actually the alter Sunnyvale's alternate on that the board for Silicon Valley Clean Energy right now. Now that we have that clean electricity, we can start putting it to use. For example, swapping out natural gas appliances for electric appliances. There are some very good uh, space heating options, water heating options coming along. So put that clean energy to use there. I think also if we can start to require more electric vehicle chargers at offices, um, that's a great way to use the abundant solar electricity that we now have in the state of California and actually store it in the vehicle so it can be used later in the day when the sun has gone down. Um, it's, it also helps us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think that, that's a huge win. Um, and working further with Silicon Valley Clean Energy, they're working on ways to encourage uh, folks in general to become more energy efficient. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. I don't think that the council has done a great job at um, getting to zero emissions within um, the city um, as far as the solutions behind um, what we can do and, and, and all those types of things. I, I think from the city perspective, um, we should look at how much we are consuming uh, in, in a general sense. Um, this is going to take all of our efforts, um, and the city can lead the way by being more forthright and saying, hey, this is what we can do to incentivize this type of thing. This is what we can do to provide these resources so that you can make the choice to be more efficient. Um, the city can also um, demand that it have all electric vehicles, and, and uh, including these electric chargers in more reasonable places, not just where people are living in an apartment, but even in some of these businesses that have been brought as part of the developments that have come up. Thank you. And rebuttal, we'll please. Oh, you, you have a rebuttal. 30 seconds for the rebuttal. Yeah, so uh, Sunnyvale has already taken a look at what we can do both individually and as a community. Uh, that's in our climate action plan with over 130 different actions. Uh, that Silicon Valley Clean Energy was one thing that came out of that, but there are many other items there as well. Um, and we are currently in the process of updating that. So yeah, it, it is important that we look at it. We're already looking at it. We already have a process. Uh, we actually have made that a, a council priority. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, Mr. Alexander. Um, please specifically explain the levels of new office and new housing development that you would support and where. Also address how exactly you will provide the necessary infrastructure improvements to support such continued growth, public safety, fire, and traffic. Okay, well, uh, again, I want to make sure that everyone understands that I would never put Sunnyvale at risk of not improving its business or the residents' uh, ability to live here. Um, I think that would be ridiculous for me to say that I'm going to stop all developments. Um, I think what needs to happen is a scale back. And the reason why we need a scale back is because I think that we've seen so much uh, development that wasn't looking at the bigger picture of the infrastructure. Now, the infrastructure includes how are we addressing the school overcrowding? How are we looking at a safety and traffic? Um, these are things that are, matter to the families in Sunnyvale. Um, I've seen it so many times where uh, emergency vehicles are not able to get through. Um, the Sunnyvale Public Safety Officers Association wrote a letter to council to say that could you please scale back the development um, with, with businesses. So I think that's what we need to start looking at. And then as a council, we'll agree where we would build these developments and what makes sense. Thank you. So, so um, a, as we develop um, both specific, pro look at specific projects, but also develop area plans, uh, we take a comprehensive look at the infrastructure, what's already there, what will be needed in the future. So that's already part of the process. Already something that we look at and pay very careful attention to. Um, and things like water efficiency, new developments are actually often more water efficient than old developments. So our citywide water use has stayed flat even as uh, population has gone up, and this has been true for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, public safety is 
well. Um, we keep track of our response times. Those have been steady. Very proud of that. Also, um, I've been talking with the public safety officers. I'm endorsed by the Public Safety Officers Association because they know that I will make the decisions that will continue to keep Sunnyvale a very safe city. Thank you. And you asked you for a rebuttal. Go ahead, 30 seconds. I, I think it's hard for anyone to think that the traffic has gotten less uh, issue over the last five years. I think it's hard for anyone to debate that the schools have become more crowded. I think it's hard for anyone to debate that the public safety officers are taxed because they're having to work overtime. Now, all these things are a factor, and I believe that um, that's something that needs to be addressed when you put your vote into the ballot in November. Thank you. And now we come to the last question, and we will start with Mr. Larson because you were the second one to start at, at the beginning. So please state and answer a question you wish you had been asked. Mm. Well, I, I'm glad that you've already asked about housing. Um, I think I, I, I want to I would ask a question about who supports you in the community. Um, and my answer to that is that I have a very broad base of support. I've worked hard over the last five years uh, to make this city a better place for all of the residents. Um, and so I have endorsements and statements of support from many different people. I have um, almost 200 people around the city who have put up my lawn signs. Um, I have endorsements from many organizations, business and labor, try getting them on the same page. The Mercury News, the Sierra Club, the Public Safety Officers Association, many other uh, local organizations as well. Um, so I have a very broad base of support and I look forward to continuing to serve you and I humbly ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Alexander, what question do you wish you had been asked? I think I would have liked to have been asked if the way that campaigns are financed, if we could see a reform in that area. One of the thoughts that I thought that would make sense is if you're receiving more than $2,000 from a uh, PAC or, or some sort of developer, um, and those types of uh, projects go up to vote, why not recuse yourself from voting on those things? I think that's something that really means a lot to people, that they want people who are in leadership, that they can believe in, that there's no, uh, there's no in embodiment of any type of feeling that there's anyone owed anything. Now, what I owe to you as residents, since I've been completely 100 individually financed, is my best for you in Sunnyvale. So if you're ready, I ask that you vote for me and hit for vote for me, um, and I ask you that we can work together for a change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. And so now we will take just two minutes for them to come down, and we'll get the next the candidates for seat two up on the dais. Uh, no, put him over there. And here's the other one. Goes here.
Could I ask the people in the aisle to sit down so we could, other, everyone can see? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, t turn on your mic. Test. Push. I, I know how it now works. you're on. Okay. I, I know how oh, you're going to turn it on and off? Yeah, I know how it works. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I just want to repeat a little bit of what I said at the beginning uh, so these uh, candidates will know what the rules are that they agree to. They have agreed to a format and ground rules for tonight's forum. The candidates will have 60 seconds, one minute, to respond to questions. A timer seated at the front of the room will give candidates visual signs, signals to help them pace their responses. We have allowed time for rebuttals. Each candidate is allowed two 30 second rebuttals. You have been given two rebuttal cards to indicate to the mod moderator that you wish to rebut a statement by your opponent. This is for a rebuttal only, not a new statement. Okay, and we're going to start with Question number one with Josh Grossman. What do you bring to the city council that Sunnyvale needs but doesn't have? Well, I think what I bring to the Sunny, Sunnyvale City Council that it needs and doesn't have right now is complete independence. I have only individual contributions to my campaign. I have only individual contributions to my campaign. I've taken no money from PACs, developers, or corporations. And I think, and I think that's, that's something that's going to set me apart. In addition, I'm a tech executive as well as a, an attorney member of the bar. And I'm paid to have good judgment. And I think that judgment I'll bring, plus my past experience as a school board president and the chair of our Housing and Human Services Commission, makes me uniquely suited uh, for this position. And I'm excited to. Uh, Join the council if that should occur. Thank you. Mr. Hendricks. So um, the experience I bring is I have 30 plus years of tech, high tech um, management experience. Um, I have three and a half years I've been on this, was on the city's planning commission before I became on the council. I have four and a half years of being on the city council and dealing with issues that come up. And I have two and a half years experience as being the mayor of the city of Sunnyvale and dealing with the complex issues and the nuanced answers that need to um, be crafted to go ahead and keep Sunnyvale running smoothly. Thank you. So we'll start this question with Mr. Hendricks. What is the most important priority for Sunnyvale City Council to work on in the coming year and why? So the most important thing that I always start with, talk about on the City Council is the city's budget. Um, the city budget is the key factor that drives anything that we're going to be able to be done. It's what lets us have um, good core services in the city of Sunnyvale, um, high quality public safety, um, our parks, libraries, um, being able to keep our roads um, in shape, um, trees trimmed, uh, sidewalks maintained. Um, once we do those things, and, and we're only able to do that when we have a solid budget, then we can go ahead and we can look at other things like we've been able to go off and do with the Silicon Valley clean energy um, and other type social issues and be able to look at things we can do um, to try and address um, lower income housing and things like that. But it all starts with having good solid finances in the city of Sunnyvale and the city of Sunnyvale has a good um, balanced budget, but it's fragile due to um, things that are going on in the economy. Thank you, Mr. Grossman. Well, I would narrow that down and say it's less than a year. It's work the clock is running, so we've got less than 40 days. We've received a letter from a powerhouse law firm asking us to move to district elections, and it appears that we're not doing anything in terms of trying to negotiate with them, and I think there's kind of a fundamental misunderstanding about what we need to do. We need to work, whether you like district elections or not, we need to have a strategy that's going to limit our liability to $30,000, not end up with a $4.5 million judgment like the city of Palmdale. And we need to do that very quickly because the clock is ticking. So that's what I would address immediately because it's the most pressing issue currently. Thank you. So I have this little card. Oh, oh thank you. So <laughs> I, I would just go ahead and respond that the city of Sunnyvale um, is negotiating with the lawyer firm um, that has sent us a letter, letter about the CVRA. It is not something that is going to be done in public um, with what's going on. I can assure the public that the city of Sunnyvale is actively working on this and working to go ahead and get to an appropriate solution that will be done according to the charter of the city of Sunnyvale and not just a random decision by the city council. And a rebuttal over there. I would just seconds. say I would like the uh, the mayor to then commit to limit our liability to thirty thousand dollars, 
and act to move within the 40 day, 45 day grace period. If we don't do that, that ship has sailed and we're going to be stuck with a very costly, expensive lawsuit, which we will lose. No jurisdiction has triumphed in one of these lawsuits. Thank you. Now, moving on and I'm, I think Thank it's you. Mr. Grossman mm -hmm. going to be first this time. Um, in Sunnyvale, the median rent is $3,000 and the median home price is $1.9 million. What strategies would you champion to help make Sunnyvale a more affordable place to live? Well, first of all, we've got to sort of start with the low-hanging fruit, if you will. I don't love that phrase, but I'm going to use it. We've got to protect our stock of affordable housing that exists now, and that means our mobile home parks. So we need to very quickly take the 400 acres of mobile home park that exists and have a ballot initiative for the folks to vote on that preserves that in perpetuity as well as getting mobile home park rent stabilization on the ballot. That's critical. We need to let the people decide. That's something we need to do immediately to preserve that area. Another thing we need to do is increase our 12.5% affordable housing fee. That's an in lieu of fee and we have numerous examples of places like Butcher's Corner where you have a development with zero units of affordable housing. And instead of affordable housing, you have that money going to a, a pool of money that sometimes we're not able to spend. Uh, so I, th those are two things I think are quite important. Mr. Hendricks. So what, what the city is, is doing is we're going ahead and we are zoning more areas of the city for housing. What we need to do is allow for more zoning of housing so that we can have more housing stock be built in the city of Sunnyvale. Um, Mr. Grossman mentions the 400 acres of mobile home parks. Those are already um, preserved that they are going to be staying as 400 acres. Um, the city is required to have 400 acres um, preserved. Um, we need to build more housing near transit um, so that people have an opportunity to be able to use transit as opposed to single occupancy cars. And we're also going to be changing right now. We require 12.5% um, of housing in developments to go uh, to affordable housing. And I believe that this city of Sunnyvale is going to change and move to the 15% for that um, very shortly. Thank you. Am I finding my, my place here? Okay, uh, Mr. we're going to start with Mr. Hendricks. State Proposition 10 provides for cities to establish local rent control policies. Do you support a, pro a pros Prop 10 and why or why not? So I think the real issue with Prop 10 is um, what Sacramento is going to do. Um, Sacramento is not going to take this, their hands off the steering wheel of what's going on with that. So if Prop 10 passes, Sacramento is going to pass some other rules and regulations that are put in place. Um, if Prop 10 passes and um, Sacramento doesn't do something like that, then I think we need to go out and we need to go talk to the residents in the city of Sunnyvale and find out what the residents want. Um, this is one of the things, the council gets to go ahead and make um, decisions and has some final votes on things. But the decisions of what we do should not be just based on what seven people think. You need to be able to go out and talk to the residents in the city of Sunnyvale, get input on about what they want, and not just what seven people who sit up here um, want to go ahead and do. Mr. Grossman? So, uh, you know, I think first and foremost, I believe in local control. That's why I support this initiative. I think it's important to let cities decide, as the mayor's mentioned, anything that was done with rent control is going to be a ballot initiative. But I'd also say it's important to be consistent about local control. So for example, the city council voted against a League of Cities motion to fight SB 35, which would have, the Valco project is, is a function of SB 35. We should have voted to, in support of preventing things like that. So I believe in local control all the way, and this is something that should go to a vote of the people. Thank you. So starting with um, Mr. Grossman this time, what budget challenges do you see the uh, council needing to address over the next three years? Well, I'm not sure if it'll be over the next three years, but eventually we're going to have to deal with pension reform. And one thing I don't want to see is us trying to solve that problem on the backs of working people. I think that's a mistake, particularly our city employees. So what I want to have is see uh, our business tax change. So you may or may not know that folks like Google and LinkedIn and Apple are paying about 12000 a year in a business tax. That's simply too low for a for trillion dollar companies that are literally the largest companies in the history of humanity. We need to have them pay their fair share. So I want to work to pass legislation that's going to have them pay their fair share for things like transportation and for some of our budget issues. Thank you. Mr. Hendricks? 
So because of the 20-year budget model that the City of Sunnyvale does, we have a very good understanding of what our budget, um, our expenses and revenues look like out over the next 20 years. Um, the number one thing that's going to affect our budget is pension costs. Pension costs are increasing by what's happening within CalPERS. We understand and know that our pension costs peak in the year 2030, 2032. Um, and we have good plans in place to go ahead and get us to that so we can go ahead and make and keep the commitments that have been made to um, our employees here in the city of Sunnyvale. I want to thank prior councils and especially um, the bargaining units where we've already gone ahead and created multi-tier programs. So new hires that come into the city come into a different tier, so we're not having to to do that battle right now, and I really want to thank the people that did that work before. Um, the other piece that we just have to go ahead and understand is we are a service organization, um, we, and it's the people and the, the employees in the city of Sunnyville that provide those services, and they are going to have a growing um, salaries uh, for what goes forward. So those are the two pieces in our budget. Thank you. Did I call on you? I, I think it's me, but I'm not keeping absolute track, so I'm going to leave it to you. <laughs> no, you went first that time, so I'm next. You're, you're, you're next for the next question. Or you haven't answered this question. No, I have. We talked about yeah, it. Yeah, he, he, he did it, and then I did it. And you did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the help. So now it's your turn, Mr. Hendricks, to answer this question. Proposals have been made to change Sunnyvale's um, election system to district elections in which residents in geographical areas would choose the represent their representatives. Do you support or oppose this proposal? So it's not a proposal, as was mentioned before. This is, we've got a letter from a lawyer as it relates to the California Voting Rights Act, and so this is something that we have to go ahead and deal with. What I support is exactly what the council did, which was to take, even before we got a letter, to take a proactive approach to go ahead and say, we need to go ahead and reach out to our residents and find out what they want to do on this. It, it is a charter amendment that would need to be made. Uh, contrary to some people's opinion, you, you, the city council cannot just change this. This is a huge governance model change that would take place. Um, just real quickly, right now, everybody in the city of Sunnyvale gets a chance to vote for each one of the members who's on the city council, all seven of us, over four years. If we move to district elections over a four-year period, you would only be allowed to vote for one person. That is a huge governance model change, and we need to reach out and talk to the voters and see what they want and decide what is the ballot measure that goes that they're going to vote about. And so that's what we're doing. We're doing outreach to the vet residents. Thank you. So, so first off, I, I have to correct the mayor. It's not the case that we can't change to district voting. We can. The legislature has specific laws with respect to that, and as well, those have been supported by court uh, court cases so but what we need to do is there's not sort of a false dichotomy between district elections and some other form of elections as the letter stated that we received from this law firm we may be able to move to uh, something like rank voting which is what they were able to negotiate with Mission Viejo but the part that's really important and I and I mean this sincerely we have 45 days this is not something we can put off we need to act whether you like district elections or at-large elections or rank voting, it doesn't really matter. We have to come to an agreement with this group within a short period of time or we're going to be exposed to large litigation, both our legal fees and the legal fees and interest of the folks that are suing us. So this is, this is not something we can play around with and it's not a political issue, it's a common sense issue. Thank you, Mr. Grossman. We'll start with you on this question. Sunnyvale currently has a housing mitigation fee that charges commercial development and impact fee that goes into an affordable housing program. MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, is exploring a regionally assessed commercial development fee for affordable housing. Do you agree or disagree with this kind of regional fee? As I suggested earlier, I'm really a strong proponent of local control. As Council Member Larson mentioned, I would prefer to raise our own fee from the 12.5% that we have now to something more like 20%. I think that's more effective. And I actually concur that we may have uh, problems with other municipalities in terms of the distribution of those fees. So I'd prefer something that is uh, assessed and stays in Sunnyvale. 
Mr. Gross, uh, Mr. Hendricks. So you're probably gonna hear some commonality here. Um, local control is the answer. I really don't wanna hear um, MTC telling us what to do, especially because the city of Sunnyvale has been the leader in this area. The city of Sunnyvale has had um, housing mitigation fees for multiple decades. Um, there was just a big article last year that San Jose was thinking of doing it. Everybody was all excited. Um, I was looking for the part of the article that talked about where City of Sunnyvale's had it for decades. Um, so that's really what's the important part is um, we need to go ahead and have this. Um, if they want to go ahead and put that kind of control or pressure on other cities that don't have um, housing mitigation fees and so that they can get going, that's fine. But I don't want to see something coming from the MTC that is putting pressure just on the city of Sunnyvale that's been a leader in this area, especially we're going to have some issues at the MTC. The three big cities, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose, tend to dominate things that come out of MTC, and we'll put the city of Sunnyvale and other smaller cities at a disadvantage. So um, I like what we're doing. We're ahead of the game on this. Thank you. So we'll start with you. Besides the one, uh, the 101 237 Matilda interchange project currently underway, what other road improvements or transportation projects do you envision to bring traffic relief to North Sunnyvale in light of anticipated additional development? So I would start with um, what the voters of the county voted for, which is Measure B, that's going to provide um, grade separations for. Um, Caltrain at Mary and Sunnyvale um, that's going to allow for grade separations at Lawrence Expressway um, in Sunnyvale um, that's going to go ahead and will provide highway interchange improvements um, at multiple places throughout um, Sunnyvale. We've got the Perry Park shuttle that's going to be implemented for what goes on. There are other improvements that are happening to VTA to give our public transit work that's going on. And we continue to go ahead and do work. We've installed smart street light technology on Matilda, which has reduced the travel time by about 42% from El Camino to 101. Um, and we need to go ahead and look at installing that same type technology on El Camino itself. Um, we just have to get uh, uh, the state to go ahead and allow us to go ahead and do that. So there are multiple things that we can do to be working at improving uh, the efficiency of the existing roadway and improving safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Thank you. Mr. Grossman. I think one of the first things we need to do is look at the construction that we've got on the table. So Google's bought about $840 million worth of property. And if we continue our track of creating office buildings without housing to support it, our traffic situation is gonna get worse and worse and worse and no matter what sort of solutions we try to deploy that's not going to have an appreciable impact uh, looking at, at ways we can try to make things better one i think uh, mountain view's got a great plan where they're working with google we see all the private buses that make it difficult for our own folks to get on the bus they have a shuttle service that works in their city that's something that we could do here and i suggest that we do and then secondly smart traffic our current approach is fragmented bifurcated and as you can see recently the uh, lights are not working well i do this in my day job, we need to work and have a comprehensive plan for smart city technology that we can then deploy in the city. Thank you. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Grossman. Would you share what significant contributions, if any, to your 2018 city council campaign <coughs> came from PACs? If so, what PACs? Zero. And as a matter of fact, I got a check today that I'm going to have to return, and this is the second time I don't deposit them. I have to explain to them that I'm not taking any money except from individuals. And I want to be clear on this. I think, you know, politics is basically a moral endeavor because you're, you're dealing with kind of what's the best interests of the people that live here. And that's why I believe if you take a donation from a PAC or a special interest or a developer and then you approve their project, I think that's improper. Now, I'm not impugning the integrity or the honesty of the people that do that. It's simply a disagreement about the best way to do things moving forward. And so that's why I only take individual contributions. And I'd say to all the other candidates, you can do it. I've done it. And I'm going to be doing it again today. And it's a little bit painful, but I think it's an important laboratory for our democracy. And that's part of the reason I'm running this campaign. Thank you. Mr. Hendricks. Um, so yes, I have received campaign contributions. Um, I don't have my FPCC um, report here with me. Um, so it's uh, SunPAC, various different um, unions groups, Silvar. Um, but I don't think a single check has been larger than $2,500. I am the largest contributor to my campaign. I have over $30,000 that I've put into this uh, for what goes on. Um, why do we get campaign contributions? I think that's the question to go ahead and look at. Um, 
I walk a lot of precincts. You have to pay all to pay for mailers, um, flyers, postage. We moved from odd year to even year elections, which doubled the number of voters in the city of Sunnyvale. It takes money to go ahead and get your message out to these people. Um, I am not beholden to anybody who's given me a campaign contribution, and I fail to see the difference between a developer and what is, a, or an individual, if the individual gives you money, they're gonna come up and potentially the way um, he describes it, they're gonna ask you to go ahead and do things and vote their way as well. Um, the answer is you have to be able to step and look at somebody and say, here, I'm doing what's right for the city of Sunnyvale. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, we have a rebuttal. Yeah, this is my second one. Yeah, that's your, that's second, your second one, that's your last yeah. one. Thank you, Doug. Use card one and card two. Uh, so I just say, I think there is a qualitative difference between, for example, a mobile home park resident that gives me $40 or $50 and then is concerned about mobile home park rent stabilization and an independent expenditure, which I know is not a direct contribution of $70,000 from the National Association of Realtors. Those are two qualitatively very different things. And most importantly, this corrodes our democracy because people lose their faith in the system. And that's, that's why it's so important we move forward with campaign finance reform. And another rebuttal, and this is your last one. So I think it's important to understand that independent of what money you get, when you sit in this office as a, as a council member or as the mayor, you have to be open and you have to listen to everybody that comes and wants to talk to you. You don't look and say, here, who contributed, who did not contribute. You go ahead and you meet with everybody that's here, you listen to what they have to say, and you're open and available to them. It doesn't mean you're gonna do exactly what they want, but you have to be open to hear their ideas. And I'll tell you, there are more people that come and talk to me as the mayor and councilman that never tr contributed to my campaign than people who contributed. Thank you. And now I need your help. I believe it's Mr. Hendricks' turn to go first this time. Is that right? Sure. I can't keep true from track of laps when I swim, so this is yeah, a particular yeah, that, challenge. That, that's fine. <laughs> Somebody out there knows, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Hendricks. Sunnyvale, and this time I'm going to keep initials on these. Sunnyvale led the effort to create Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which now provides 100% greenhouse gas free electricity to our community and other cities nearby. What additional changes are needed to significantly reduce our community's carbon pollution and make the city more resilient to climate change? So Silicon Valley Clean Energy is awesome. Um, it is a fantastic thing we were able to go ahead and get implemented. What else we need to do? Um, we had our CAP uh, Climate Action Plan. We're working on CAP 2.0 to go ahead and collect more ideas from our residents. Um, I think one of the biggest things we have to focus on is electrifying the fleet. Um, we have to get our transportation vehicles converted to um, using electricity um, for what goes on. Um, but I will say this, all the rest of the changes that are gonna go on as it relates to being able to reduce greenhouse gases um, are gonna be big behavioral changes. They are gonna require um, changes by our residents. Um, and so we're gonna have to do a much better job of communicating out to our residents um, the need of what has to happen, the reason why we're gonna make certain decisions that we go ahead and make to get them to be able to buy into and accept and then want to be able to make um, what is gonna be very, I think very significant changes to be able to go ahead and really reduce, um, make the next changes we need to do for greenhouse gas reduction. Mr. Grossman. To quote another, I think basically we need to electrify everything and we need to clean up the grid. Uh, we need to have no more natural gas and new construction. That's a huge uh, and easy thing that we can fix and we need to do it immediately. We need to require solar power for commercial projects, which we're currently not doing. And most importantly, and I think this is something that again is not being addressed, we need to stop building on land that due to global war warming is gonna be underwater. So this Google project is something that's very important. We really need to look at it and that's another environmental issue that I think is important. So with those four things, I think we'll be making a huge step forward and it would be quite easy to require no more natural gas and new construction as well as requiring, requiring solar for commercial construction. Thank you. And now um, we're gonna start with Mr. Grossman. Please specifically explain the levels of new office and new housing development that you support and where. Also address how exactly you will provide the necessary infrastructure improvements to support such continued growth, public safety, fire, and traffic. Well, I think first off, it's important that whatever we're building that's new needs to be built 
near existing transportation hubs, but quite frankly, the infrastructure that we have in place is not something that's going to support a lot of new buildings. And we've already got a huge number of buildings that are coming through the pipeline. So I think we need to take a step back and see what's happening. I'm not suggesting we have a moratorium, but as you know, in the history of Sunnyvale, there was a six-month moratorium on building while we kind of decided what we should do moving forward. I'm not suggesting we do that. But instead of just building office space again and again, we, we need to really look at that. And we also need to make sure that we at least have a one for one. So for every piece of office space that we're building, every unit, we also need to be building housing. So that would be my plan moving forward. Mr. Hendricks? So the first thing I'll say is he mentioned um, housing. Uh, according to the grand jury report that came out this year, Sunnyvale's um, jobs to housing ratio is 1.07 to one. So. We've already got a very solid piece there. Um, where we're looking at new, doing additional development is out in Moffat Park um, and along El Camino. Those of you who may not know, we're re looking at redoing the El Camino Precise Plan. El Camino is going to get rezoned as ground floor retail um, with housing above, um, and we need to go ahead and look at that. Anytime we take a look at zoning of what we're doing, we go out and we have a general plan process where we go and we look at the environmental impact report. We look at the infrastructure changes that need to go ahead and may be required for that. So those are all built into the, the process of what we go ahead and do. Um, so that's how we're going to go ahead and look at it. Thank you. Um, since you have both been very concise, we have time for one more question before we get to the final question. This is not going to be the final question. So and we'll start with Mr. Hendricks. The impact of SJC, I think that's the airport, south flow in the last two years due to the FAA's next gen implementation that has made airplane noise difficult for particular sections of Sunnyvale. Do you believe it is an issue? If so, what specific measures will you and can you take to address the noise? So yes, it is an issue. Um, we've heard from the residents. I, um, about this. Um, I also live underneath where South Flow um, flies. Um, I have been working on this for two and a half years. We reached out to the FAA um, after this um, started um, with the change. I was on the ad hoc committee that um, was put together for a six month ad hoc committee. I was the chairperson of it. Um, we produced a report of a series of recommendations to the FAA. Unfortunately, the way that committee was put together, it no longer exists. But as the chairperson of that, I continue to reach out to the FAA to find out when they're going to provide answers um, to that. There are a couple recommendations in there that would go ahead and uh, improve the situation for what goes on. The real problem that drives why um, that traffic flies the way it is, is San Francisco owns so much of the airspace so far south, and when they're flying south flow, the south flow uh, traffic has to stay underneath it. That's one of the reasons why it's so low. Uh, but I do believe it's a problem, and we are working on it, and the city of Sunnyvale has joined um, the next set of committees that's being put together for that. Thank you. Mr. Grossman. So I've worked really closely with the Save My Sunny Sky group, uh, and many in that group support me. I've got a detailed plan. First off, we need to have a citizens commission to help deal with airplane noise, because quite frankly, these people have forgotten many than uh, more than many people know about airplane noise. It's a very complex issue, and we should be drawing on the public's help. Uh, secondly, we need to take a different approach with the FAA. The, the jurisdictions that have been successful in this, like those in Orange County, and Arizona did it through taking a more aggressive approach with the FAA. If they believe we're just gonna roll over, we're not gonna be making progress. And thirdly, the plan we have now just simply misunderstands the issue. So we've got noise monitors that are gonna be deployed, but if you actually understand what, how the FAA looks at this, there's virtually no way to go above the noise level that's required by the FAA. So we're spending a lot of money on a solution that's not gonna work that would be much better spent on something like a consultant that we could move forward with to have a plan to aggressively work to solve this problem. Thank you. And now we do come to the final question, and we will start with Mr. Hendricks because you were second when we started with the first question. So please state and answer a question you wish you had been asked. I think the question that people should ask would be, what is our motivation and why do we want to be on the city council? Um, I want to be on the city council because I was born and raised in the city. Um, when I came after I was in the military, I moved back here. I moved here with my wife. I moved here because I wanted to raise my family here. Um, that was my sole motivation. I had lots of other places that I could have moved to, but I wanted to be here in Sunnyvale. 
Um, and now that I've been back here, I wanted to go ahead and participate um, in my city government and go ahead and do things to be able to try and make the city of Sunnyvale a better place than when I first got involved in city government. Um, things we can do to try and make people's lives better, make sure that um, our employees, their pensions, as was mentioned, are taken care of, but also that we continue to have high quality services and so that people want who grow up here, that they want to come back and they want to stay and live here. So that's what I think people should think about. Thank you. Mr. Grossman, what question do you wish you had been asked? I think a question I would like to have been asked is what do you think is the question in this race that really confronts voters? And I think that question is pretty simple and it's direct, right? So I think the question is do you believe that over the last four and a half years Sunnyvale has improved and it's on the right track? Do you believe after the two and a half years that the mayor's been in office that we're better off than we were before? And I think that's really the question that faces the city. And fortunately, in my race, it's very straightforward. So I urge you, if you believe that we're on the right track, if you're happy with the way things are working out, then your choice is clear. If you want a different approach, uh, we one thing we can agree on is that we disagree on a lot. Uh, so I'm going to have a very different approach moving forward. And so that's uh, what I would urge you to do is use that as the kind of rubric to decide in this race. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll do the same thing that we did last time. Uh, these candidates for seat two will leave and we will bring up the candidates for seat three. Okay, we're ready to start our next uh, part of the forum. And I will read to you the same thing I have read to the other candidates so you understand the, the rules. The candidates have agreed to a format and ground rules for tonight's forum. The candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to questions. A timer seated in the front of the room will give candidates visual signals to help them pace their responses. So make sure you can see the, the uh, timers and cards. <clears throat> we have allowed time for rebuttals. Each candidate is allowed two 30 second rebuttals. You have been given two rebuttal cards to indicate that to the moderator <clears throat> that you wish to rebut a statement by your opponent. This is for rebuttal only, not a new statement. 
Okay. So we are going to start with uh, Mr. Cordes. And the first question is, what do you bring to city council that Sunnyvale needs but doesn't have? Thank you very much. Yes, you're on. Thank you. Um, so what I bring to the council that I think is of the most value to the residents of Sunnyvale is decades of experience. I have 30 years of management experience before I retired, and now I have the time and dedication to be a great council member for you. I have a master's degree in engineering management, and I've worked on large, complex organizations like a city uh, doing product development across the world. I've been very engaged in Sunnyvale since uh, retiring from work. I'm a member of Livable Sunnyvale. I'm starting my fifth year on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission, and I'm uh, starting my second year's chair. Um, currently also serving on Sunnyvale's Climate Committee because I care dramatically about the future of our planet. And I want to make sure the kids grow up safe, so I'm on our Sunnyvale Safe Routes to School Coalition. I'm one of the two volunteer co-leaders for that organization. I can go on and on. I'm also a member of Livable Sunnyvale, which is an advocacy group here. And you can find out a lot more about what I do on my website. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fong? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you to the League and everyone for being here and everyone watching at home. Before I begin, I would like to publicly and sincerely apologize for a mailer that I sent out I made a mistake, I was owning that mistake, where I listed Congressman Ro Khanna as an endorsement. He has not endorsed in Sunnyvale City Council seat three race to set the record straight, and he has been very gracious and understanding in this mistake. I deeply, deeply apologize, and I would never want to misrepresent anything and anyone. With that said, I bring experience and new ideas to the City Council. I'm also a member of Liverpool Sunnyvale. I am the chair of the Sunnyvale Board of Library Trustees, and I am, have actually worked in government behind the scenes to do policy and community outreach. I have served under Congressman Ro Khanna and Congressman Mike Honda, and I currently work as the housing and transportation policy analyst to a council member in the city of San Jose, where I work on traffic mitigation, I work on affordable housing, I work on public safety, and I work on the environment. Thank you. And Mr. Fong, we'll start with you for the second question. What is the most important priority for Sunnyvale City Council to work on in the coming year, and why? I think the most important issue is to secure a future for our city and our future generations of Sunnyvale residents and current residents. I want to increase access to the Sunnyvale dream that many people had in the 1960s of moving here owning a home, and sending their kids in the, to schools in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I'm finding that more and more difficult as someone who makes less than $60,000 a year who's wondering, how am I going to stay here? How am I going to be able to experience the great city that we have and make sure that others are going to do that? And how that I will do that is making sure that your taxpayer dollars are spent wisely and that we invest correctly in our future. That means building a branch library in the Sunnyvale North Sunnyvale in the Lakewood Branch Library. That means completing our sewage water treatment plan. That means making sure that we stay the safest city in America three years in a row, and also making sure that we generate revenue to provide the best city services in the entire valley. Thank you. Mr. Cordes? I want to focus on quality of life issues for Sunnyvale residents, and the number one category that people bring up in that is uh, traffic condition. So I've worked on traffic as the chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission for quite a while now. I've also served on the Sierra Club's Sustainable Land Use Committee, where we also tackle this. And I'm also a member of the Sierra Club's uh, Transportation Committee for the whole Bay Area. So I'm deeply involved and have studied this for quite a while, and I think it's the most important thing that uh, pain point for residents today. Um, there are a lot of other issues in the longer term that I think we need to do address. Uh, regarding the budget and creating a sustainable future for all of us. But the number one issue we should tackle is, is traffic and congestion. One of the things I want Sunnyvale to do is form a transportation commission. Cities around us that have their own shuttle systems have transportation commissions or assign it to some part of the government. So I definitely want to do that. Uh, Sunnyvale needs to start the Sunnyvale shuttle system. We have a million dollar grant from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission to fund a s shuttle. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Curtis, we'll start with you with this question. I do let you finish your sentence or your thought, so you don't have to cut off immediately. 
In Sunnyvale, the median rent is $3,000 and the median home price is $1.9 million. What strategies would you champion to help make Sunnyvale a more affordable place to live? So this issue is near and dear to my heart. I've had friends like Rich Colbert who've been forced to leave Sunnyvale and he was a very active member in our community because he could no longer afford to stay here on his fixed income. I'm seeing the same kind of problems concerned with a lot of the people that live in the mobile home parks. So one of the first things we need to do is get rent stabilization passed in Sunnyvale for the residents of the mobile home parks. Um, Sunnyvale is one of only two cities in the Bay Area that does not protect our mobile home park residents that way. 60% of them are on fixed or limited income, so we've got to do that. The next thing we need to do is to zone more land for more housing. So Sunnyvale is doing a pretty good job of focusing more housing in our tra uh, transit corridors and redeveloping some of our old, old business parks because more housing will help keep, uh, keep the cost down. We also need to increase the, um, find more funding to build more affordable housing. So I think there's a variety of strategies, including the head, uh, employee business license tax, employer business license tax, that would be great sources for more funds to help people like Charity Housing build more housing. Thank you. Mr. Fong? Yes, yeah, so this issue is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm a big fan of senior housing and workforce housing, and we need a plan to get that done. I'm also a big fan of mobile home preservation. We're keeping our zoning as it currently is. We need to increase the stock, but we also need to increase the stock across city lines because Sunnyvale is the leader in producing housing, but other cities are not as prevalent. And so we need to figure out as a region, how are we going to tackle this issue? Uh, we also need to generate more revenue, as my opponent mentioned. I am also in favor of increasing the business license tax in order to pay for general fund items. But we can generate all the revenue we need, but we need to invest it wisely. And so we will be working with organizations like Housing Trust Silicon Valley, Midpen Housing, all our nonprofit providers that actually can go take the city's money and multiply it and then find the right financing to build the housing. Workforce housing is is very important to the city because our employees are not able to live here. And if we can't retain them, your city services will go down. Thank you. Mr. Fong, State Proposition 10 provides for cities to establish local rent control policies. Do you support or oppose Prop 10 and why or why not? I have publicly supported Proposition 10 because I believe in local control. I believe a city should be able to do what it wants to the full extent that it wants to. If, prop uh, if Proposition 10 is if supported and Costa Hawkins is repealed, I believe that there will be a very robust conversation at the state legislature to see how can we look at vacancy decontrol, the different components to rent control, and make sure that it works for each community. But I think that it's really important to have a city and its residents be able to determine the way legislation works because ultimately a city like Sunnyvale might have different priorities than a city in Central Valley. Thank you. Mr. Cordes? I've been a strong advocate since it was first I heard about it that I want to support the repeal of Prop 10. I want a yes vote on Prop 10. I think local control is the best solution. Uh, I agree that the state did a big overreach when it forced the same standards across all cities in the entire state. Every community should have the right to figure out for themselves what they think their best way to control uh, their growth and their resident who can stay in, who can afford to stay in their cities. So very much in support of local control and um, then we can have a robust decision uh, Sunnyvale actually has a big housing study going on right now that I've been participating in and the City Council intentionally decided not to include uh, apartment rent stabilization in that. But it'll be interesting to see n now that ho if this uh, law gets passed and overturned what we want to do as far as the city going forward who get the community together and figure out what makes sense so that we don't uh, slow down the growth of housing stock. We need to continue to add the sto housing stock. But we need to find inventive ways to protect the residents that are here. Okay, Mr. Cordes, what budget challenges do you see the uh, council needing to address over the next three years? So I've been studying Sunnyvale's budget for three years now, <laughs> and it's a thousand pages, just to give you a clue. <laughs> and it's a very um, complicated document with a lot of priorities in it, and it's, it's so very important. Sunnyvale is the, one of the safest and best rated cities in America because of the way we do our budgeting with a 10-year uh, balanced budget requirement in our, in our charter and our 20-year forecasting tool. So those are all great. I've been involved with the, the uh, 
uh, study issue looking on how Sunnyvale can increase its revenue. We actually have a separate study issue looking at revenue increases. For example, one of the things that came out of that is the ballot measure we have this fall on increasing the hotel occupancy tax that you're all going to get to vote on from 10.5% uh, to 12%. So I think Sunnyvale's budget is in very good shape long term. The thing that I think that uh, one of the things I really appreciate is we do have our own actuary that looks at what we think our costs are going to be in the future. We don't go by what CalPERS tells us. We figure out what we think our risks are and we manage our risks ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fallon? So I, I listened to the eight hour long budget study session in May and thank you to the council for their hard work on our budget and past councils. They've done a great job. We have a 20 year budget as everyone knows. And one of the biggest things that was said in the May discussion was pensions. That's, that's the big item that's gonna come up. We have a lot of negotiations that will be coming up for our service employees, our firefighters, our police officers and our employees. And so. That's a big ticket item that's going to be my first priority on the council because that will be by June and July, hopefully, the negotiations will be up for discussion. I am also a big fan of increasing revenues because we, although we've been able to absorb the 2008 recession, we haven't been able to necessarily increase city services to the amount that we've been growing. And that's a big ticket item because you feel that as a resident, you feel that when you're stuck on 101, you feel that when you're stuck on Lawrence or Fremont, or you're stuck at a light and it's not optimized to be able to let you drive efficiently. And so that prevents you from being able to drop off your kids and other things. Thank you. And Mr. Fong, proposals have been made to change Sunnyvale's uh, um, uh, election system to district elections in which residents in geographical areas would choose their representation. Do you support or oppose this proposal? So I support this proposal because ultimately a lawsuit would put the taxpayer liable uh, in the city. So I want to thank this current council for taking a proactive outreach. They haven't wait, waited to be sued. They've proactively said, we need to study this because this is coming. And that's the foresight that is Sunnyvale's strength. And so I work for a council member now where we are in a district and there's a lot of benefits and a lot of cons. And so I'm very well versed on district elections. I'm very well versed on how a district would operate if implemented. And I'm looking forward to being on the council to be able to explore that more. Thank you. Mr. Cordes. I'm in favor of a district elections for a couple of different reasons. One of them is I do think it will give um, uh, better opportunity for diverse candidates to run and be successful in Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale did a study issue in 20, 2008 and found that 10 out of 11 times the person that raised the most money won. This is not the way we should be electing our officials. We need to be having, and one of the big advantages of smaller districts is it's easier for candidates to get to know their constituents and be able to run. So for people that want to be represented by their neighbors and actually have somebody that's concerned about what's going on in their neighborhood, I think the change to uh, district elections is going to be a huge benefit for all of us. Um, we have way too much outside money flowing into elections in Sunnyvale. It's been a problem for, for a long, long time. It's easy for uh, the developers to figure out who they need to fund to make sure they own four of the seven seats on the council. And we have to put an end to this, and I think district elections is going to be one of the great ways we do that, including and increase the opportunity for uh, local residents and local areas to be better represented. Thank you. Mr. Cordes, Sunnyvale currently has a housing mitigation fee that charges commercial development an impact fee that goes into an affordable housing programs. MTC is exploring, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, is exploring a regionally assessed commercial development fee for affordable housing. Do you agree or disagree with this kind of regional fee? I disagree with a regional fee, just as I've said on a Prop 10, I think local decision-making control is the best way for Sunnyvale to move forward. Sunnyvale has done better than almost any other community in building housing. Uh, that's, unfortunately, I wish I could say that was great for affordable housing, but we're still like at 7% for the next planning cycle on the number of affordable housing units we build building. The only reason that um, is a good number is it's better than anybody around us. So. Um, we definitely need to increase the fees we charge for housing so that we're doing a better job of creating more affordable housing. And I, I think increasing the fees we charge to the developers is one of my strategies for creating more affordable housing in Sunnyvale. I've looked at this issue for a long time, and I think it's the right move for Sunnyvale to make to not give up our local control, to increase our local um, f revenue sources so we can afford to build more affordable housing in here. That includes um, 
making it possible for developers to lower their costs in certain locations like along transit corridors by not requiring as much parking and also uh, allowing them to um, make units smaller. We, right now, oftentimes developers will put everything in as four bedroom or three bedroom because they don't have enough Your room. Your time is up now, Sorry. thank you. Mr. Fong? So I am also not supportive of a regional housing impact fee. Uh, my big issue is how are those fees going to be allocated because if you look at other regional commissions, there's always a fight for money between cities. And so if we are the second largest city in the county, will we be proportionally represented when there is a larger city in the county that represents 10 times the amount of people that Sunnyvale does? That's my big concern. Uh, the county is currently looking at a sub arena task force and they're looking at ways to increase the supply of housing and be able to make sure that it's fair. And I'm supportive of that exploration. Um, I'm a big fan of urban villages, and that's what I really think the residents are going to feel the most, is if we can hone in on those community shopping centers and make sure that people can live, shop, and work in one central location, we will reduce traffic, provide affordable housing, and make sure that we retain the character of our neighborhoods. Thank you. And we will start with you, uh, Mr. Fong, on this one. Go turn to traffic now. Besides the 101-237 Matilda interchange project currently underway, what other road improvements or transportation projects do you envision to bring traffic relief to North Sunnyvale in light of anticipated additional development? My favorite question and everyone's favorite subject, traffic. Um, <laughs> There's already a lot the council's doing. The Perry Park shuttle program in North Sunnyvale that's provided by VTA funds. Um, the MTC Horizon plan, meaning that cities are allowed to propose a project to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission to explore big ideas like tunneling underground for subways. I'm honored to have worked on this issue for many years on Caltrain electrification, BART to Silicon Valley, and much more on light rail. And so I'm looking forward to be able to make sure that our residencies are able to have Caltrain uh, uh, grade separation at Lawrence Station and downtown, uh, more efficient traffic flow when there's a proposed development in the neighborhoods to avoid neighborhood traffic, and to make sure that light rail works in North Sunnyvale, because we have a lot of proposed development, Google, Facebook, other organizations, and we can get community benefits from them and help them pay for the impact that they're making. Thank you. Mr. Cordes? Thank you. So I've been studying traffic issues for quite a while as well. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm on the Sierra Club's Transportation Commission. We've been studying the, the issue because it's affecting everyone up and down the Bay Area. Uh, particularly in the northern Sunnyvale, since I'm up there and I uh, relate to the people and I've been trying to help the people in the mobile home parks, I've been paying attention to this. Uh, one of the things is that we need to, again, try and solve the jobs housing imbalance better than we've been doing in the past. So we need to be focusing on how we're going to add more housing in Sunnyvale as a way to mitigate traffic impacts, right? We're going to have to make it so people aren't commuting so far to get to their jobs. We also need to uh, form a transportation commission that I mentioned before. We need to dramatically improve the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure in Sunnyvale. We need to create more urban villages so people are less dependent on their cars to get around. Uh, Sunnyvale only has 1.5% people that commute by bicycle. Mountain views it at six and Palo Alto's at nine. So I want to triple the amount of people that are getting around by bicycles in Sunnyvale and we need to invest in infrastructure to do that. Thank you. Mr. Curtis. Sunnyvale led the effort to create Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which now provides 100% greenhouse gas-free electricity to our community and other cities nearby. What additional changes are needed to significantly reduce our community's carbon pollution and make the city more resilient to climate change? So I've been focused on climate since 2005, even before Inconvenient Truth came out. It's been a Sierra, the number one Sierra Club pr priority since then. Um, I'm on Sunnyvale's Climate Committee, so I've been actively working on how we're going to be able to meet our 2040 targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the number one recommendation from the, um, the consultants that are working with us on that is we have to build more housing so people have to drive less, right? The number one way, we have to effectively cut 80% of our driving out, and the only way we can do that is with more housing in Sunnyvale. Also, we need to stop digging holes, so we have to ban any new natural gas installations, right? When you're in a hole, you have to stop digging, so we have to stop promoting the burning of fossil fuels, and that means everything going forward is going to be electric. I was... Uh, 
read the staff report on the green building program that just came out this week, and they're only proposing that all electric be required as the top level incentive program. They're not requiring it in any of the lower levels, and I think we really have to go back and tell them that's not enough. Thank you. Mr. Fuang? Yes, so the green building program will be coming to the council soon. Um, and so that's a great program to incentivize more clean energy usage at our office spaces and, and even in our residential. Um, transportation makes up about almost half of what our carbon emissions are, are left. And so we've been doing a great job, the council has done a great job on reducing carbon emissions, but transportation is the big ticket item. And so one thing is, yes, build where we live, work, and shop. So mixed use development, increase the source of mixed use development and incentivize it. Um, convert by the 2020 st state mandated standard for CEQA analysis for our environment to reduce our carbon emissions to vehicle miles traveled to be able to more effectively evaluate how traffic is created. Alternative forms of transportation, electric biking, electric scooters, and working across city lines. That's the biggest thing for me is that we have a lot of connections that can be made that can incentivize bicycling, that can incentivize walkability. And so Wisman Station in Mountain View and other places. Thank you. And we'll start with you, Mr. Fong, on this. Would you share what significant contributions, if any, to your 2018 City Council campaign were from PACs? If so, what PACs? Yes, yeah, so I'm honored to have a diverse support, um, and I've been able to have you know, business support and also labor unions in addition to residents. And so I am a big fan of making sure that before I take a contribution, I speak with that person and I tell them my values and say, if you don't agree with them, I understand and I look forward to working with you, but I cannot accept your contribution. And so when I meet with the business community, my top priority is small business and retaining our small business, making sure our dry cleaners can stay here, make sure that if we do redevelop anywhere, that we keep the character of our community. When I've met with the unions, I tell them, I am one of you. I am a service employee. I make under $60,000 a year. I pay $1,200 a month in rent plus utilities, and I'm not saving a single dime. And so how am I going to afford that half a million dollar condo, that $750,000 unit? How am I going to afford a $2 million home to be able to send my future kids to Fremont High School and Cupertino and Homestead High School? So that's a big ticket item for me, is making sure that my support reflects my values. Thank you. Mr. Cordes? Thank you. I am not taking any donations from any political action committees or developers in, in almost 74% um, of my donations have come from Sunnyvale residents. I'm, you know, I, the highest donation I think I have is uh, to date is $1,000, right? So I'm dependent on many of you to contribute to my campaign. I have many, many volunteers helping me succeed because I'm not going to be able to outspend Mr. Fong. He's, he's raised triple the amount of money that I have and only 22% of his funds are coming from within Sunnyvale, right? That, so I don't know why the California Realtors Association PAC is giving him $2,000. And the California um, uh, Bay Area Council independent expenditure of $7,000 of $7, for a mailer for him and Mr. Uh, Larson. And the California Apartment Association Committee is giving him a $5,000 independent expenditure. I mean, they're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. So um, I have to wonder what's going on. Thank you. And we have a rebuttal here, um, 30 seconds. So any resident can look on the city clerk's website and go to the net file system to see the transparency. And I want to be a transparent council member and public official. I have received, as I mentioned, uh, funds from both businesses and labor, but labor is the most important to me because I represent working families. I'm fighting for working families to be able to stay here. Uh, I've received, uh, you know, IEs are actually independent expenditures and we have no control as candidates. The committee is actually the one that decides how to spend their money, and those are filed on net file in, under a different section. Thank you. And let's see, we start the next question with, <laughs> can't read my notes here. Uh, Mr. Cordes, is that correct? Or I believe so. Okay, now let me find the question. So that one was nine, and I'm looking for 10. Please specifically play, uh, let me start over again. Please specifically explain the levels of new office and new housing development that you support and where. Also address how exactly you will provide the necessary infrastructure 
improvements to support such continued growth, public safety, fire, and traffic. So I've been engaged in Sunnyvale for a long time. It's my home and I'm um, deeply committed to it. I've been involved with the general plan update that Sunnyvale did. And I've been involved with the Lawrence stationary plan that's still in the process of being developed. I've been involved with the Lawrence, uh, the El Camino Real specific plan. So those are the places where Sunnyvale has picked to, to do our future growth. They're gonna be all around 6,000 homes at Lawrence Station, around 5,500 homes at, along the El Camino Real, four miles of the El Camino Real corridor. There's 1,000 homes planned for 1 AMD place where Duane and Stewart meet. Um, so you can see I've been deeply involved in, in looking at this for a long time. As far as more infrastructure, I think it's appropriate for the businesses that are driving uh, all our traffic congestions, particularly impacting the police officers, that they have to provide more funds to provide more services that we need in Sunnyvale. Um, we've done the nexus reports that show the impact of these businesses, and we are not requiring that they pay anywhere near the fees that they, for the uh, services they require. Thank you. Mr. Fong? Yes, yeah, so I believe that the city council is looking at transit-oriented stations like Lawrence Station, downtown, El Camino, and Moffitt, and I agree with those. I'm all about budget diversification because if we want to slow office growth, we look at we need to follow the money and look at the numbers. And 40% of, of our revenue is property tax, 20% is sales tax. So if we increase mixed-use development through our urban villages and through other items, we can actually make sure people can live work and shop in one place, and that our budget isn't reliant on office space. We also need to make sure that our public safety officers can adequately address our emergency response times, and we're missing 12 positions in our city. And when I've met with the public safety officers, that was one of the first questions they asked me. How are you gonna make sure we can do our job? And they support me because my strategy is to make sure that we have an actual master plan to fill our vacant positions, not only in public safety, but in our parks department, in our public works department, in all of our city, because that makes our job a lot better. Thank you. And Mr. Fong, the impact of San Jose, SJC, San Jose Airport, <coughs> South Flow, in the last two years due to the FAA's next gen implementation has made airplane noise difficult for particular sections of Sunnyvale. Do you believe it is an issue? If so, what specific measures will you and can you take to address the noise? Yes, I believe it's an issue. I've been dealing with this issue in various roles. I first encountered it in Congressman Mike Honda's office where I was the point staffer for it. And thank you to the Mayor Hendricks for his leadership in establishing an ad hoc committee, which is a bunch of cities put together that are going to have a louder voice to our FAA director. Um, the big issue that I saw was that we need to be able to act regionally in order to be taken seriously on the federal level. And I'm thankful to be able to have that experience working on issues in different levels of government and knowing where the pressure points are and how to strategize to actually solve the issue. I do believe it's issue. I've knocked on many doors. I felt my window uh, shake during South Flow and it, you know, it wakes up uh, young children and make sure that their parents aren't able to be 100% at the workplace. And this is, these are issues I've encountered when knocking on doors of residents. Thank you. Mr. Cordes? I've been working on this issue for quite a while myself. I even attended some of the ad hoc meetings that were being held in San Jose. I got there on my bicycle from here. Um, so I've, I've met with the Save My Sunny Skies people. I've talked with them. I've talked with plenty of residents that are very concerned about the noise that say they can't sleep when the South Flow is in effect. Um, I've talked with Congressman Ro Khanna. I've talked with Anna Eshoo. Um, they are trying to put pressure on the FAA to change the noise standards, which is really the only possible solution we have for this. I'm concerned that we may have to go to a, uh, we should definitely hire consultants to help represent us, and it's gonna take a lot of us to try and change this. We are in a really tight box with three major airports in uh, the Bay Area about where we can move the planes. There were 72 recommendations from the Save Our Sunny Skies that they asked the FAA to say, why can't you do this? And they shot down almost every single one of them. So it's gonna be a complicated problem. They've got a lot of knowledge. We should uh, leverage their expertise in trying to find a solution for solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you. And now we come to the final question. And we will start with Mr. Fong because he was second in the, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> please state and answer a question you wish you had been asked.
I think I wish I had been asked, what drives you to make a difference in your community, whether it's on city council or in any role? And I've had the honor to work with various elected officials and be mentored by them. And what it really comes down to is public service is not about service to oneself, but service to one's community. And I'm a strong believer in that. And so for me, I come from a public service family. Uh, my mother was a planner, worked for Governor Brown. My father was a uh, staff member to an elected official. And they instilled in me community organizing. That's where the core of my values are. And when I make any vote on the city council or I have any discussion in the community at a planning meeting, I will be making sure that I represent the community and I'm organizing for the community. That I'm trying to make sure that your neighborhood reflects your character and your values when a hotel is proposed behind your house. When a El Camino is having renovations with the county and the state. And so that's really something I hope that everyone can uh, be able to take away from this. Thank you. Mr. Cordes, what question do you wish you had been asked? So um, I wish I'd had more time to talk about everything I'm trying to do for the residents of Sunnyvale. I didn't get anywhere near enough time in 60 seconds to cover what I'm doing. Um, I serve at the homeless shelter for the residents of Sunnyvale. Um, I also volunteer at my church with the homeless shelter. We have them come stay with us for a month, a year. I um, run the family giving tree program at my church for gathering gifts in the, at Christmas time and doing the backpack drive in the summer. I'm heavily engaged in trying to do everything I can to make Sunnyvale better. Uh, I've served three years as my neighborhood association chair. We're the only neighborhood association chair to do a float in the Sunnyvale parade. We're also the only one, we're also the only one to find a form of 501c4 to better service the residents. So now we, it's easiest for us to collect money and, and spend it. And we do that a great job of that in Snail. We have the most active neighborhood association around. We have monthly newsletters, monthly speakers. Um, it can go on and on. You'll have to check out my website if you want to see everything. So thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about why I'm passionate about Sunnyvale and why I think I should be your next council member. Thank you. And join me in an applause for these candidates. And thank you, candidates, for participating in this forum. And, and considering serving the community. The candidates will remain after the forum to give you a chance to talk with them individually. You may also pick up candidate literature um, at the table at the back of the room. Visit lwvcs.org in the coming days to find video of tonight's forum. Go to the calendar on that website and scroll down to the listing for this event to find the link for the forum video. I also encourage you to check out VotersEdge.org, formerly Smart Voter, the League of Women Voters election information website. Among other valuable information content includes money behind political campaigns for, at the federal and state levels. I want to thank the audience for coming tonight. I also thank all the people who sent us questions by mail. We greatly appreciate the city of Sunnyvale for the use of the board for the re re use of this council chamber and for the KMVT crew whose work makes this forum available to all city Sunnyvale voters. We hope tonight's forum has helped you with your voting decisions. Please remember to vote on November 6th. Good night. Good night.